hear my cry, my cry for true, my cry for true, my cry for you. Greetings and welcome. I am Pastor Mark Lambert of Liberty Hill Baptist Church in Moody, Texas, where I serve my congregation, serve the Lord, preach the word, and am a daily illustration that God does indeed choose the weak and foolish things of the world. Before we get rolling, I would like to take this opportunity to let you know if you're catching this podcast um, prior to Wednesday, April 26th, I am going to be having our quarterly question and answer event at Liberty Hill Baptist Church there in Moody. You can check out the website, lhbcmoody.org, for more information on that. If you're within striking distance, we'd love to have you drop in and join us. So this first question uh, is an interesting one. I was asked, are Christians Jews? Well, the simple answer there is no. Wasn't that easy? Next question. Just kidding. The full question was actually this. If Christians followed Jesus and Jesus was Jewish, wouldn't that make Christians Jewish as well? Um, the, the easy answer is no. We're, we're not Jewish. And, and there's a simple reason why. Being Jewish means two different things. First off, you have a people and you have a religion. In one sense, ethnically, to be a Jew is to be a descendant of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Right? Of the, the people of Israel, of that um, lineage, is to be a Jew. So, uh, in that sense, completely separate from whether or not you follow Christ, you can be a Jew or not, depending on your lineage. But the second meaning is probably the one in play here, which is the religion of belonging to the religion of Judaism, of being Jewishly, you know, following that faith practice. But the religion of Judaism has some specific characteristics that Christianity does not. Now, it's true that we share a lot of things, that we, we worship the same God, um, at least as far as the Old Testament's concerned. We follow the same scripture, several things that we believe about God and certain other ethical and moral things that we do hold in common. However, there are some core things about Judaism that... Um, would differentiate it from Christianity. One, they see Moses as the chief prophet. I mean, you cannot get much better, much higher than Moses. Obviously, in Christianity, we, we like Moses. Mo's cool, but Jesus is the head there. Uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, according to Judaism, is closed. There, there is no new revelation coming. They don't accept the New Testament or any of that writing because the books found in the Old Testament their Bible is done. No no more word from God coming. Of course, we believe that there is additional word from God. We call it the New Testament. The Jews are still waiting on their coming Messiah they're looking forward to. We obviously believe he has already come in the person of Jesus. Their guiding principle is the law of Moses and that whole covenant system under that law. Uh, we, of course, believe that Jesus fulfilled that law and that covenant, so we are no longer part of, bound to that covenant and that law. The system of reward and punishment that they kind of view everything as, that their whole system, the religious practice is built on reward and punishment for obedience and disobedience. We focus on grace. Yes, obedience is important. Yes, God will discipline um, his children. However, our focus is on grace, not on reward and punishment. And then Christianity is definitionally a different system than Judaism. Right? We, we, we may have some roots in Judaism. That may be where we come from, but that is not the same thing. Labels have a meaning. Words have meanings. There is a distinction that says that this thing over here is Judaism and this thing over here is Christianity. And the two are not defined the same way. So despite some commonalities, 
despite some shared beliefs, despite some shared scripture, despite um, the background that Christianity owes to Judaism, uh, Christians are not members of Judaism. It may help to think of it this way. The founding fathers of the United States were British citizens. Does that therefore mean that Americans today are British citizens? Right? Of course not. It's, there's a distinct characteristic that would distinguish the two. And, and we kind of recognize that. But for some reason, when it comes to religious stuff, we can kind of get a little fuzzy. Right? Our, our thoughts and ideas kind of wander a bit. And things that may be clear-cut in a different setting, not so much in the religious setting. However... I do believe that um, just as Americans are not Brits, Christians are not Jewish. Now for this second question. I have been asked uh, by several people, one in particular, um, my thoughts on The Shack. Whenever the book originally came out, I never read it. Not typically my cup of tea and some people that I tend to trust said you know, some critical things of it, so I, I just wasn't interested. And then, now that the movie has come out, it's back into the front and center of many people's thoughts, and there's no shortage of information out there about this work. However, some people have asked my thoughts, and so I will offer them. I went... Um, to the library, got me a copy, actually on audiobook, and I listened to it while I was driving around, running errands and doing other things. And so I do have some thoughts on this issue. Now, there are a lot of people out there who have dealt extensively with some of the deeper, higher theology issues of the shack. I'm not going to try to get into those too much here. I really want to look at basically two commonly addressed main issues and then just kind of give some reflections. The first one is this idea that the shack portrays a false picture of the Trinity, that uh, the understanding of the Trinity put forth in the book is false, is wrong, it doesn't quite get it. Now there's some aspects about this issue, about the portrayal of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and how they interact and how they do that kind of left me a bit confused or maybe cautious in how the Trinity was being presented. However, I also understand that any attempt to depict the Trinity will have problems. Anytime you try to find a way to show a one-of-a-kind thing it will have limitations. It's going to fall short. There is no analogy. There is no depiction. There is no illustration of the Trinity that will ever actually show the Trinity as it really is. It can't. It's just not possible. However, in the book, when the characters who depict the Trinity uh, are, are directly asked and they directly address the issue of the Trinity, uh, their description is correct. What, what, what they say about themselves matches up with Orthodox belief about the Trinity. Now, how that actually ends up playing out between the characters as the story unfolds, uh, well, there's some parts that make me kind of go, ooh, not sure about that. For first off, they all three have nail scars. Okay, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all have scars from the crucifixion. Well, but Jesus, the Son, was the only one who actually was crucified. God the Father was not crucified. God the Holy Spirit was not crucified. Um, Papa, the, the character representing God the Father, tells the main character... Uh, the time when three persons of the Holy Trinity spoke themselves into human existence as the Son of God. The problem being, all three were not the Son of God. Jesus alone was the Son of God. And so, you, there's some things where it's just kind of like, okay, I'm not really sure where you're going with that or what you're thinking. Um, but there's also some clever moments, I think, 
that kind of captured it. At one point, Mac, the main character, he's trying to wrap his head around all this, and he asks. Uh, he's sitting at the table with the three persons and asks, okay, so which one of you is God? And they all turn in and together say, I am. Okay, that was kind of clever, because that's really kind of how it is. They're all three God. That is the Trinity. All in all, I think the depiction of the Trinity was not as big of an issue with me. I mean, it's a com complex issue, and even experts and theologians who spend their lives studying this will argue about some of the details and specifics. In general, I, I think it basically got it close enough to the mark that it doesn't really ruffle my feathers regarding the Trinity. There's some, maybe some that feel different. I know people who get hair-splitting, nitpicky, into the nitty-gritty details about that. I'll leave that to them. It didn't really bother me quite so much as others have. For me, it's the second issue that kind of makes me go, uh, hold up, back off. It's this idea of universalism. That everyone will end up going to heaven. Everyone's going to end up saved. Um, that God isn't a big, mean God with judgment. That everybody goes to heaven. Now, nowhere does the book actually come right out and say that all people are going to be saved regardless, but it does kind of dance around the issue and there's some implications. At one point, uh, the character of Jesus tells Mac that he is the best way that any human can relate to God. Not the only way, but the best way. Uh, okay, that's, you know, kind of getting into pluralism, universalism kind of stuff. I um, doesn't flat out say it, but it's dancing around the issue a little too close to the line for my comfort. Also, the author, uh, Paul Young, I believe, he is a universalist. In other writings and other interviews and things, he has flat out said that that is his belief. So the person who wrote the book is a universalist. However, there are other people who were involved in the project, in the book, and in the movie who are not universalist, and they kind of tempered his view on this, so the book doesn't blatantly say it, but it does kind of get close to it. And there's one part along these lines that did kind of rustle my feathers. Uh, at one point, Papa, right, the God the Father character, he corrects Mac by saying that I don't need to punish people for sin. Sin is its own punishment devouring you from the inside it's not my purpose to punish it. It is my joy to cure it. Now, sin does carry its own punishment, right? To a degree, I mean, you, you, you reap the rewards of what you sow. Romans 1 actually lays out what uh, some call God's passive wrath, right? Rather than calling down judgment upon us, he just backs off and says, fine, have it your way and allows us to reap the penalty of our actions. So yeah, in that in that sense, sin is its own punishment um, that we have to endure that. And it is indeed God's joy to cure sin. But let's be clear. The Bible does not dance around this. God punishes evildoers. Wickedness brings upon the wrath of God. That I mean that that's all through Scripture. You cannot escape it. You would have to go through your Bible with a black marker and mark up a ton of verses and passages because it's just in there. So God does punish. There is wrath. Love. The fact that God is loving demands wrath against the wicked. It demands punishment against those who would harm those whom God loves. Another thing that's kind of in this book that um, I haven't heard addressed too widely is this idea that everyone is God's children. But the Bible's clear that not everyone is God's children. Whenever you're in Christ, you are adopted into the family of God. That is when you are referred to as sons and daughters of God. Not just everyone on the planet. He loves everyone. He wants everyone to come to repentance. But not everyone has the father-child relationship that those who are in Christ have. And whenever you're a parent, someone who wants to do harm to or has done harm to your child, is that not a righteous indignation? 
is in that desire for If someone is attempting to harm your child, there's a story from a, uh, not too long ago where a guy walked in on a man assaulting his daughter and he just pounced on the guy and ended up killing him. And of course, he is not considered to have done any kind of crime because, hey, what parent walking in on that situation is not going to have wrath against those harming their children? So God's love actually demands wrath. And if there's no punishment, then there was no need for Jesus to go do what he did on the cross and take away that punishment for us. That's central to the gospel, that God is sovereign, but we are in rebellion And the fact that we get forgiven and we receive that grace is whenever we give up our rebellion, throw ourselves on the mercy of God, and ask for His forgiveness. So the idea that there is no wrath, there is no punishment, completely undermines the entire gospel and the whole work of Christ to begin with. So that would be my negative problems with the content of the book. So reader, beware. Um... However, I will say this, a a positive, it is great inspirational material for grief or sorrow, for for ideas on how to address what's called the problem of evil, right? God, why would you let this happen? If you are so loving, how could you allow, right, those kind of questions? This book does a good job of addressing some of that. Um, However... I'll tell you, if you have daughters, this is a hard read, especially if they're little girls. Okay, I have three little girls. The oldest is six. And in this book, the pain and grief and sorrow the main character is going through is the loss of a child. And those early chapters and the parts that dealt with that were gut-wrenching. I was driving along, listening, bawling my eyes out. It, it Warning, okay, that's what you're walking into if you read or listen to this book or watch the movie. So there's that disclaimer. But also, I'm not really a fan of this kind of religious fiction that is put into a non-fictional setting. Okay, because you get this emotionally charged story set in a realistic, I can place myself in that setting kind of situation, and it's easy to get that bigger impact And whenever you don't already have a solid understanding of the theological issues addressed, it can cause more confusion than it actually helps. So let me give you an example of how maybe a nonfiction setting versus the fiction setting. Okay, in The Shack, it's set in a shack in modern-day Oregon, I believe, up that area. Um, Let's compare that to Narnia, completely fictitious. Okay, so as someone is reading The Shack, and it's just pulling these emotions, and it's you know having this impact on them, they can get caught up in that, and the parts that are kind of poetic license, uh, the, the, the parts that aren't you know really accurate, kind of get carried along with everything else and become a part of your thinking, now attached to this emotional experience, and you can become confused as to what is real and what is not. Whereas in Narnia, you're not going to be confused by thinking Jesus is really a lion, right? You, you, you know you, that is obvious metaphor, that is obvious analogy, that, that is obvious symbolism. You're not going to walk away confused about whether or not John, uh, Jesus has fur and fangs and claws, right? That's not going to happen. But it still conveys the point of who Jesus is. Whereas in something like the shack, um, it can all get Uh, all twisted around together, taken as a package deal, throw in the intense emotional charge language and experience of it, and it can lead to confusion pretty easy. Kind of a weird um, thing along those lines, how fiction can become reality. I still run into people who um, believe that the uh, New Testament documents were kind of put together by the Council of Nicaea, and this idea of Jesus uh, being God was made up at the Council of Nicaea 300 years after the fact. 
and they get this from the Da Vinci Code, which is a work of fiction, but it's got so much history that is true mixed in with the conspiracy theory of the fiction that I know people can't tell them apart. And they honestly think this is the way it was done. So you don't get your theology from a work of fiction. And whenever it's a work of fiction set in a nonfiction, real-life setting, it just makes it that much more difficult. Also, there are plenty, plenty of true stories that are very inspirational and have good theology that you can go to to get this kind of built-up, find-your-answers um, and not have to struggle through wrestling with the flawed theology of the author. So, there we go. That's my thoughts on The Shack. Take it, leave it, flush it. Um, that's my 50 cents worth. It's like two cents, but adjusted for inflation. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, that concludes this episode of the Hey Pastor podcast. If you would like to have a question addressed on the podcast, go to heypastor.org and you can submit your questions there. I would love to have the opportunity. See you next time. I'm Pastor Mark. Until then, grace and peace. Hear me now, Lord. I'm calling for you to find me here, to find me here.